Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to this webinar with the title Fetal Syndromes. Now, earlier I was scheduled to present diabetes in pregnancy, but I proposed to the chair of the education committee that we need an update on fetal syndromes. And the discussion went through the committee and it was agreed that I will be presenting this particular topic. And as fetal physicians, we are the ones that has, have first contact with the fetus and therefore we should know everything about it. And we are the ones that manage the fetus in neutral. But again, the information we gather while the fetus in, is neutral is valuable to those who are going to manage the infant at delivery. So the information we gather over time while the fetus is neutral will help the subsequent management of the fetus. And that is why this topic I feel is important. And there are areas of ambiguity which we need to clarify through this presentation. And uh, clarifying these uh, areas of ambiguity is important as it will help us in managing any case of epitel syndrome that we come across in our daily clinical practice. So let me start by projecting the picture of an iconic person who in 1866 described a syndrome that he called Mongolism. He's no other than John Langdon Down. And the syndrome he described in 1866 is now named after him and it's called Down syndrome. Now the outline of the presentation is as you can see and at the end of the presentation I will give two examples of two syndromes which will now illustrate what I have discussed through the presentation. Now the word syndrome is derived from the Greek language meaning run together. So a, a general definition of a syndrome is the association of signs, symptoms, features, and characteristics which occur together in the same individual. That is the general definition. But there are more comprehensive definitions which will come across later in the presentation. So, now, there will be a lot of definitions in this presentation. And one definition we have to understand and get clear about is fetal dysmorphism. A dysmorphic feature is a difference of body structure. It can be an isolated finding in an otherwise normal individual, or it can be related to a congenital disorder, a genetic syndrome, or a birth defect. And dysmorphology is defined in the study of dysmorphic features, their origins, and their proper nomenclature. And the severity of dysmorphic features can vary from mild anomalies such as clonodactyly to severe ones such as holoplus and saply. In some cases, dysmorphic features are part of a larger clinical picture, sometimes known as a sequence, a syndrome, or an association. And recognizing the patterns of dysmorphic features is an important part of a geneticist diagnostic process. Now, we need to define these three entities. A sequence is a pattern of multiple anomalies that result from a single anomaly or from a mechanical factor. And an association is a random, is a non-random occurrence in two or more individuals of multiple anomalies not known to be a sequence or a syndrome. And a syndrome is a pattern of multiple anomalies thought to be pathogenetically related. And we have to give examples of the three entities. A good example of a sequence is Porter sequence or oligohadramnios sequence. And the component of this sequence include club fit pulmonary hypoplasia, and cranial anomalies. And it is due to oligohydramnios experienced by the fetus in utero, causing deformation 
in fetal morphogenesis. Now, an example of an association is vata association, whose components include vertebral anomalies, imperforate uh, anus, and esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal pustula. And an example of a syndrome is the popular Down syndrome, which is a result of a single genetic abnormality affecting chromosome 21. Now, there are more comprehensive definitions of two terminologies that I have defined earlier. And I derive these two new uh, uh, definitions from two important internationally recognized databases, the OMIM, or the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, and the LDDB, which is a London Dysmorphology Database. So they define a syndrome that the association of several clinically recognizable features, signs, phenomena, or characteristics that often occur together, so that the presence of one or more features allows the healthcare provider to the possible presence of the others. And clinical dysmorphology in the study of abnormal human development with a particular emphasis on rare syndromes causing malformations or alterations in body form. Now, how, do, how does fetal maldevelopment arise or occur? There are three processes through which you can have fetal maldevelopment. It can be as a result of a malformation, a deformation, a disruption, or a dysplasia. And we have to take each one, define it, and give an example. Now, a malformation is commonly defined as a single localized poor formation of tissue that initiates a chain of subsequent events. A good example is an encephaly which occur as a result of failure of closure of the anterior neural tube prior to 26 days of fetal life, which subsequently leads to the degeneration of the poor brain. A deformation is a result of extrinsic mechanical forces on otherwise normal tissue, and this is illustrated in the characteristic pattern of abnormalities, including abnormal facies, pulmonary hypoplasia and limb contractures that result from prolonged oligohydramnios, either secondary to renal agenesis, when you describe this combination of features as Porter syndrome, or from premature rupture of membranes, which you now describe this combination of features as Porter sequence. So it is the cause of oligohydramnios that determines whether you are talking about a syndrome or a sequence. Now, a disruption results from an extrinsic insult, which destroys normal tissue, altering the formation of a structure. And this is what we see in amniotic band or limb strangulation syndrome. In this condition, torn amniotic tissue strands surround a portion of the body, open digits or extremities, resulting in deep groups or in severe cases amputations of that particular limb or digit. In dysplasia, the primary defect is a lack of normal organizations, organization of cells in tissues. And this is best illustrated by the pattern of abnormalities found in achondroplasia, where a defect in the gene encoding fibroblast growth factor 3 results in abnormal uh, cartilage formation. So this is at the basic processes through which you can have fetal maldevelopment. Now this slide is projected just to illustrate the variety of syndromes that we can see in our daily practice. Now how do we look for syndromes? The first approach is screening and screening is a strategy used to look for as yet unrecognized conditions or risk markers in individuals without sign or symptom of their condition. And in this context, we use some ultrasound sub markers. These ultrasound sub markers are not in themselves abnormalities, but rather 
ultrasound findings which may indicate an increased risk of underlying abnormality. And we screen for these ultrasound soft markers between the gestational age of 16 weeks and 20, uh, 20 weeks. And we evaluate eight markers. Five of these markers are associated with increased risk of fetal aneuploidy. And in some cases, with non-chromosomal abnormalities. And they include thickened nuchal fold, echogenic intercardiac focus, mild ventriculomegaly, choroid plexocyst, echogenic bowel, and echogenic bowel. There are three others which are associated with an increased risk of non-chromosomal abnormalities when they are seen in isolation. And they are single umbilical artery, a large cisterna magna, and fetal renal alectasis. Now, uh, how do we, how does a marker qualify as an ultrasound salt marker? It is not through arbitrariness. There is a criteria. For example, a nuchal fold equal or greater than 6 millimeter is abnormal at 15 to 20 weeks, and it is considered as a soft ultrasound mark. Short humerus, when the ratio of measured to expected humeral length is less than 0 0.90, it is considered abnormal and is an ultrasound soft mark. Now, hyperechogenic bowel are four chi in the petal bowel whose brightness or echogenicity is equal to that of bone. And if they qualify, they, that is how they qualify as uh, ultrasound submarker. And echogenic intracardiac focus are bright dots in the left and or right ventricle of the heart, whose brightness is equal to that of bone. And that is how echogenic intracardiac focus qualify as a fetal ultrasound submarker. Peter renal paralysis qualifies as a soft marker if the anteroposterior diameter of the renal pelvis is 4 millimeter or more. And for nasal bone, the absence of nasal bone is in itself a soft ultrasound marker or a hypoplastic nasal bone. And that is when it is less than 2 millimeters is an ultrasound soft marker. Or when you take the ratio of the fetal biparietal diameter and nasal bone length. If that ratio is more than 11, then nasal bone qualifies as an ultrasound soft marker. So it is based on criteria that we select which signs qualify as ultrasound soft markers. Now let's look at diagnosis. Where you have specific malformations a syndrome will be defined by a particular combination of components of the major criteria which are essential to the diagnosis together with components of the minor criteria which may be present or absent. So this is the criteria of making a diagnosis of a Peter syndrome. Now with this, let's go forward and look at more uh, things as we discuss uh, uh, fetal syndromes. Now, why is diagnosis important? Diagnosis is important because it provides us the best way to care for the patient. And it also helps us in determining the recurrence rate of a particular syndrome and aid in the best approach to monitor future, uh, future pregnancies. And our ability to provide as clear information as possible is of great importance as it will lead to less confusion in the parents and even in the healthcare providers. So what are the information that are important that we have to deliver to the parents? Fetal prognosis, the need for invasive prenatal testing, the obstetric management plan, and the short and long-term neonatal prognosis. And then uh, antenatal uh, uh, and neonatal management decisions. And sometimes even information about the presence 
of support groups. As you may know, certain syndromes have support groups and it will help the parent to cope with what they have at hand when you link them up with these support groups. All this will go a long way in aiding parental understanding of the condition uh, of the syndrome in question. So that is why we need to deliver information as much as we can. Now again, sometimes our zeal to look for a syndrome is based on suspicion. For example, when you have a known pattern of anomalies, for example, when you have cystic dysplastic kidneys with encephalocele, this will raise your suspicion of Michael Gruber syndrome. Two, if you have a recurrence of a set pattern of anomalies, for example, recurrent left diaphragmatic hernia with facial cleft, this will now lead you to suspect the presence of Friends syndrome. Or there is a history of marital consanguinity. As we know, consanguineous marriages lead to transmission of certain genetic traits and certain syndromes. So you'll begin to suspect the presence of a syndrome in particular family when you have history of marital consanguinity. Sometimes the history will help you, the history of a family group will help you to construct a family pedigree chart. And if you look at the family pedigree chart, you might have noticed that at certain points in the family pedigree chart, there are couples of families with particular syndromes. So the couple presenting to you belonging to that particular family may likely have a syndrome that you identify in the family pedigree chart. Or you have a history of exposure to teratogens. And teratogens, in most, time, most cases, cause fetal uh, anomalies and fetal syndromes. So suspicion is sometimes what pushes us to explore further, to look for syndromes and anomalies. So, but there is an issue here. Detection. How much can we detect a particular anomaly? The detection rate for all the anomalies or syndromes is not the same. And it depends on our clinical experience in the detection of anomalies. And it also depends on the type of fetal congenital anomaly in question. So for some, because they are so obvious, even the novice can identify, detection rate is as high as more than 90%. For some, 70 to 80 percent and for others 50 to 60 percent so the type of fetal syndrome or fetal congenital anomaly also determines how easy it is to determine so let's go into etiology of fetal syndromes you can divide the etiology of fetal syndromes into two groups those that are chromosomal in origin and those that are non-chromosomal in origin. An example of chromosomal syndromes are trisomy 21, 18, 13, etc. But other syndromes may arise from mutant gene defect. For example, apart syndrome, which is a gene defect on chromosome 10. Infective agents sometimes are the cause of a particular syndrome. For example, Rubella is associated with Rubella syndrome. Cytomegalovirus is associated with uh, Cytomegalovirus syndrome. Then exposure to certain teratogenic agents. For example, the anti-epileptic drug Penitoin is associated with fetal hydantoin syndrome. And also sodium valproate is also associated with valproate syndrome. Or the use of addictive substances, for example, alcohol, which give rise to fetal alcohol syndrome. So if you are talking about chromosomal groups, you also should understand that there are those that are not due to chromosomal abnormality. For example, for example infective agents, teratogenic agents, addictive substances. All these fall under the category of non-chromosomal uh, 
fetal syndromes. Now, a chromosome anomaly can be as a result of a missing chromosome, the presence of an extra chromosome, or the presence of a regular portion of your chromosome. So these are what can lead you to have a chromosomal abnormality. Now, chromosomal abnormalities can further be divided into two. They can be as a result of an atypical number of chromosomes, which we now call numerical chromosomal anomalies or quantitative chromosomal anomalies, or structural chromosomal anomalies, which you now call qualitative abnormality in all of the chromosomes. And you need to do a karyotype to elucidate or to unravel which particular uh, type of chromosomal abnormality you need to do. And a karyotype refers to a full set of chromosomes from an individual which can be compared to a normal karyotype for a CPC by genetic testing. And a chromosome anomaly may be detected or confirmed through karyotyping. Now, these chromosomal anomalies, when do they arise and why do they arise? Chromosome anomalies usually occur when there is an error in cell division, which can be during meiosis or mitosis. Those errors that you have in chromosome arising from meiosis are to do with sex chromosome, chromosomal abnormalities. And those errors that occur during mitosis are associated with autosomal uh, uh, chromosomes. And there are many types of chromosome anomalies. And we are going to see some of this as we go through the presentation. Now, another important terminology which we need to define is aneuploidy. Aneuploidy just means an abnormal number of chromosomes and occurs when an individual is missing either a chromosome from a pair as in monosomy or has more than two chromosomes of a pair as in trisomy, tetrasomy, etc. Now, aneuploidy can be further divided into two. It can be autosomal aneuploidies and it happens in autosomes or sex cell uh, aneuploidy as it happens in sex chromosomes. In humans, an example of a condition caused by a numerical anomaly is Down syndrome, also called trisomy 21. And we will see later why it is called trisomy 21. This is an autosomal trisomy and an individual with Down syndrome have three copies of chromosome 21 rather than two. And trisomies are associated with advanced maternal age. Now, another example is that of a monosomy. And a good example is Turner syndrome, where the individual is born with only one sex chromosome and the karyotype is X0. And this is a sex chromosome aneuploid. So this slide, I use it to divide numerical chromosomal anomalies and structural chromosomal anomalies and how they arise. I've explained already aneuploidy. Now, for structural anomalies, there are processes that could lead to chromosomal, structural chromosomal aneuploidies, and they include translocation, deletion, insertion, inversion, ring formation, or isochromosome formation. These are what will lead to structural or qualitative aneuploidies. And this slide is just to emphasize what I said earlier, that in aneuploidy, one or few chromosomes is present above the normal number. And in polyploidy, more than two sets of chromosomes are present per nucleus. And 23 chromosomes make one set of chromosomes. Now let's look at, again, in more detail, some of few, uh, two more examples. Now, a monosomy is a form of aneuploidy 
with the presence of only one chromosome instead of the typical two in humans from a pair. And partial monosomy occurs when only a portion of chromosome has one copy while the rest has two copies. A good example I want to emphasize is Turner syndrome, which is a sex chromosome aneuploid. And typically, a Turner patient has one X chromosome instead of the two sex chromosomes as in the XX. And Turner syndrome is the only full monosomy that is seen in humans. All the others, all the other cases of full monosomy are lethal and therefore the fetus does not survive. Another example is cri du chat or the cry of the cat. Now, in this particular condition, persons affected have malformed larynx. And it is because of the malformed larynx that they, they make noises like the cries of the cat. This is an autosomal aneuploid. A partial monosomy caused by deletion of the end of the short P arm of chromosome 5. So while tonus is a sex chromosome aneuploid, Criduchat is an autosomal aneuploid. Now this particular slide is just illustrating the abnormality in the two syndromes, Tona and Criduchat. Now again, Concerning numerical chromosomal abnormality, we have to talk about trisomies. And I've already talked to you about trisomy 21. And I said I will tell you why we call it trisomy 21. A trisomy is a type of polysomy in which there are three copies of a particular chromosome instead of the normal two. Trisomies are sometimes characterized as autosomal trisomies. That is trisomies of the non-sex chromosome and sex chromosome trisomies. Autosomal trisomies are described by referencing the specific abnormal chromosome that has an extra copy. For example, we call Down syndrome trisomy 21. That is referencing the affected chromosome. Trisomies can occur with any chromosome but often result in miscarriage. Now looking at this, I have divided uh, numerical trisomies, uh, numerical uh, uh, chromosomal disorders into two. Those that are due to autosomal uh, uh, cause or those that are due to sex chromosome cause. And examples are, as you can see, Downs, trisomy 21, 18, 13, Trisomy 9, Trisomy 8, which is called Wakani syndrome 2, and Trisomy 22. While Trisomy of sex chromosome include Triple X, Klinefelter syndrome, and XXY syndrome. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's look at triploidy. Triploidy is a rare chromosomal disorder. And individuals with triploidy, uh, triploid syndrome have three copies of every chromosome for a total of 69 rather than the 46, which we know is the normal. And a fetus with triploidy has three haploid set of set, sets of chromosomes. Only one in 10,000 infants is born with triploidy. And it is estimated that for every live born infant with triploidy, 1,200 have been lost as miscarriages. And most infants with triploidy are either stillborn or die shortly after birth. Fetuses with triploidy, uh, triploid syndrome are usually lo lost in miscarriages. Triploidies occur 1 to 2 percent in 1 to 2 percent of all conceptions. There are no risk factors for triploidy. Triploidies are not more common in older women like uh, Down syndrome. Couples who have one pregnancy with triploidy do not have an increased risk in future pregnancies, and triploidies are not hereditary. Now, thus far, we have discussed structural chromosomal disorders. No, uh, numerical chromosomal disorders. Now, we have to discuss structural 
chromosomal disorders. Now, when the chromosome structure is altered, this can take several forms. It can be from deletion, where a portion of the chromosome is missing or deleted. Unknown disorders in humans include wolf Hutchinson syndrome, which is caused by a partial deletion of the short arm of chromosome 4. Another example is Jacobson syndrome, also called the terminal 11Q deletion disorder. Now, another way that could lead to structural chromosomal disorders is duplication, where a portion of the chromosome is duplicated, resulting in extra genetic material. A known example in humans include charcot marie tooth disease type 1A, which is caused by duplication of the gene encoding peripheral myelin protein 22, so-called PNP22, on chromosome 17. Now, the other way is through translocation, where a portion of a chromosome is transferred to another chromosome. And there are two main types of translocation. Reciprocal translocation, where a segment from two, where segments from two different chromosomes have been exchanged, one to the other. The second is Robertsonian translocation where two acrocentric chromosomes fuse at the level of their centromere. You char characterize a chromosome based on where the centromere is located. It can be central, it can be just above the center. When the centromere is just above the center of the chromosome, it is described as acrocentric. And in humans, this only occurs in chromosome 13, chromosome 14, 15, 21, and 22. Then, what about inversion? Inversion is another process we can have structural anomaly. In inversion, a portion of the chromosome has broken up and turned upside down and reattached. Therefore, the genetic material in this case is inverted. In insertion, a portion of one chromosome has been deleted from its normal uh, place and inserted into another chromosome. Ring formation happens when a portion of the chromosome has broken off and formed a cycle or ring. And this can happen with or without loss of genetic material. And in isochromosome, these are formed by the mirror image copy of the chromosome segment, including the centromere. And the last but not the least is two chromosome instability uh, syndromes, which are a group of disorders characterized by chromosomal instability and breakage. They often lead to increased tendency to develop, to develop certain types of malignancy. A good example is the Nijmegen breakage syndrome and Bloom syndrome. So these are the processes through which you can have structural chromosomal disorders. And this slide is just to illustrate pictorially these processes that I've described. And if you look at it clearly, you'll understand it more. Now, how are chromosome abnormalities inherited? We should understand that most chromosome abnormalities occur as an accident in either the egg or the sperm. And therefore, the anomaly is present in every cell of the body. Some anomalies, however, can happen after conception. And this will lead to mosaicism where some cells have the anomaly and some do not. Chromosome anomalies can be inherited from a parent or can occur de novo. And this is why chromosome studies are often done or performed on parents when a child is found to have the anomaly. Now, if the parents do not possess the abnormality, it was not initially inherited. However, it may be transmitted to subsequent generations of that family group. So, again, we have seen how structural chromosomal abnormalities occur. But how do we now look for them in other ways? We have mentioned karyotype. Now, prenatal diagnosis is testing for disease or condition in the fetus 
before it is born. That is the standard definition given by WHO. And this can be achieved through conventional karyotype of different tissues, such as coronary villi, amniocytes, or even lymphocytes. Another procedure is fluorescent in situ hybridization, so-called FISH procedure. Results from this particular procedure can be obtained in as little as 24 hours. So you can have results within a very short time. But it is always wise to do a complete conventional karyotype in addition to the FISH testing so that you can have a comprehensive analysis of the chromo chromosome abnormality that you are uh, discussing or you are looking for. Another procedure is non-invasive prenatal testing, so-called NIPT. NIPT uses cell-free fetal DNA from the plasma of the present, uh, pregnant woman. What it means is, instead of doing invasive procedures which are associated with complications, miscarriage, importantly miscarriages, you can now just take the maternal blood and subject the cells you isolate and culture to these procedures that I mentioned earlier. And it is because, uh, it is based on the presumption that in pregnancy, fetal cells are found in maternal blood. Now, instead of needling the fetus, you can just take samples of maternal blood, isolate fetal cells, culture them, and then conduct your test that I've just mentioned. This has tremendous potential as a screening tool for fetal aneuploidy. NIPT is a screening test, and it is not a diagnostic test. We should all remember that. With this exponential expansion of knowledge, humanity today is facing an ethical dilemma and also a demographic dilemma. With our knowledge of science today, we can count sex chromosomes. And if we can do that, it means we can determine fetal gender in utero. The question will be, would the availability of fetal gender information lead to gender selection? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. And we are beginning to see that in the most populous countries of the world, India and China, where there is preference of certain genders. And then if a couple do not have the gender they desire, they go for termination. And that is why in those countries there are laws that prohibited fetal gender disclosure. And if we allow this to continue, then this can lead to demographic catastrophe skewing sex distribution in people of a particular gender. This is an ethical dilemma because it will lead to terminations and also a demographic dilemma because in the long run, if this is allowed, a certain gender will predominate and that will destroy the natural balance in gender distribution. But that is not to say there are no benefits of knowing fetal gender before uh, uh, the fetus has developed uh, significantly. For example, in Turner syndrome, you can identify that this baby is a toner baby. And that will help you to prepare the minds of the couple of what to expect when the child is born. And another thing is, what about anomalies that are lethal? Now, if you say that, you will not do anything when you identify a lethal anomaly. It means you will expose the mother to the dangers of pregnancy as she carries the pregnancy to nine months. And it's possible she could develop a very serious uh, complication such as antipartum hemorrhage, which will kill her, postpartum hemorrhage, which will also take its toll on her, or even eclampsia, which will also take its toll on her. So in cases of lethal, congenital lethal anomalies, you can opt for pregnancy termination at the beginning so that the mother will not go through pregnancy 
and develop these complications which will increase her risk of death and increase of morbidity. Now, ultrasound is a tool in fetal syndromes. How, do, how does ultrasound help us? Today, ultrasound is an indispensable tool in prenatal diagnosis because it provides us with access to fetal tissue for further testing as in basic prenatal procedures. It also provides us with clear images which help in identifying morphological aberrations. And there are different ultrasound modalities available, 2D, 3D, 4D, and today we are talking about HD Live, which is the end, high-end ultrasound procedure. 3D and 4D ultrasound give the examiner the opportunity to identify not only normal and abnormal fetal structures in explicit details, but reveal functionality of some organ system, especially fetal brain. And there, the real-time observation of fetal behavior patterns, for example, facial expressions, eye movement, mouth movement, finger movement, is of great value in making prenatal diagnosis. Because these facial expressions reflect new uh, development and maturational processes of the fetal central nervous system. And one gentleman, Professor Asim Kriya, designed a test, and he called it Canet test. Canet means antenatal neurodevelopmental test. And he took inspiration from the work of Emil Tison. Emil Tison designed a test to assess fetal CNS, uh, sorry, neonatal CNS maturation. So what he does is he use 4D to assess combination of parameters of fetal behavior and create a scoring system that assess the fetus and determine its neurological status. Canet appear to be able to identify functional characteristics of the fetus that predict normal and abnormal neurological development. And this is valuable in the context of fetal syndrome evaluation. Now, the high end, today the high end ultrasound modality is HD live. This is the latest and it gives you realistic visualization, almost photographic imaging of the fetus. And pathological changes, particularly surface defects, are observed with great clarity and detail. And that is why all these modalities are important in fetal evaluation, looking for fetal congenital abnormalities and looking for fetal syndromes. Genetic syndromes in children are often diagnosed on the basis of craniofacial dysmorphism. And three-dimensional ultrasound has improved the detection rate of facial abnormalities and helped in the definition of syndromic entities. And transvaginal high-resolution ultrasound and 3D ultrasound has helped is in establishing new subspecialities, talking about sonoembryology, neurosonography, sonogenetics. It enables early diagnosis of major fetal abnormalities. The brain is better evaluated as a 3D structure. And for this, we need basic anatomical knowledge. And one of the reasons that makes fetal neuroimaging difficult is because we lack the basic neuroanatomical knowledge. So if you are going to study the fetal brain, you need basic neuroanatomy to be able to navigate through that particular field. Now, we are coming to a close, and I would like to project some fetal syndromes and their morphological signatures. You can see for each of the syndromes, there is an image, there is a picture demonstrating what is the characteristic morphological aberrations in that particular syndrome. You can look at this. You can also look at this. These are less frequent syndromic uh, conditions. You can look at this. Each one has a peculiar 
morphological signature that you can identify it with. And then you can look at this. You can look at this. I've explained amniotic, uh, amniotic band syndrome. You can see what it is all about. And then achondroplasia and even hollow prosencephaly. Now, last but not the least part of this presentation, like I promised, is to give you two examples of syndromes that will illustrate what we have described during this webinar. Number one is Down syndrome. And it is seen in one in 700 pregnancies. The incidence of Downs increases with advanced maternal age. And fetuses with this syndrome generally have structural anomalies. It is an autosomal uh, trisomic syndrome. And it was first described by John Langdon Down. And that is why the name of this particular syndrome carries his name. Now, for Down syndrome, there are other sound abnormalities that we can detect. You can see the myriads of features that you can look for and identify with the ultrasound. And this is another set of features that you can look for in a Down's fetus and identify. Now, this is an ultrasound image of facial, fetal facial profile. And it's just to is just meant to show you the presence of the pututum tongue when you have uh, microglossia. Now, thicken local fault. In this image, you have a transverse section and it's showing you the thickened local fault. In this particular one, is a longitudinal section of the fetus and it's still showing you thickened nuchal fold. So you can identify thickened nuchal fold when you do ultrasound. I perhaps you can pick this particular feature. Now we have discussed or we have talked about the nasal bone as an ultrasound salt marker. In this image on the left, the, the, the nasal bone is present. But if you look closely here on the right, it is not present. So it's a fetal ultrasound soft marker that we can look for when we are suspecting Down syndrome. And we have mentioned that one of the features of Down syndrome are cardiac anomalies, especially atrioventricular septal defects. And you can see the various types of atrioventricular septal defects in a case of Downs. It can be muscular, illate, or subiotic. Then again, another soft marker in Downs is duodenal atresia, where you see the classical double bubble when you take a cross section, a transverse section of the fetal abdomen. So that's Down syndrome. Now, another one is a monosomy. And I asked the question Do you recognize this lady? The lady is telling you what she has. And she has what? Down syndrome. Now the incidence, oh, sorry, Turner syndrome. And the incidence of Turner syndrome is 1 in 2,000 to 5,000. And most fetuses with the full syndrome are miscarried in the first trimester prior to prenatal diagnosis or have large cystic hygrometer plus severe lymphedema leading to death later in gestation. Those who survive have regression of the cystic hygrometer, resulting in the classical waving of the neck of the affected person. Survivors may present a stoner mosaic. Most times it's the stoner mosaic that survive. It is also associated with coarctation of the aorta, which requires intervention. What are the ultrasound features of monosomy uh, of this monosomy, Turner syndrome, that can be detected by ultrasound. These features include large septic cystic hygroma, severe lymphedema of all soft tissues, consistent with lymphagectasia, pleural effusion, ascites, coarctation of the aorta, horseshoe kidney, and short femur. So these are the classical features that you can detect on ultrasound when you have a Turner's uh, syndrome. 
distinguished ladies and gentlemen to conclude let me say that opening the pandora's box is easy understanding its content will be a miracle and you need to unravel this miracle it is up to you i have done my part thanks for your precious time distinguished ladies and gentlemen